All right. Today is Thursday, March 3rd, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. We start with the breaking news that we got after the bell. We have apparently a fire in a nuclear plant in Ukraine, and the futures took a dive down the last time I checked. But for now, this appears to be an unfolding situation as we speak right now, so I don't have the entirety of the details for you. We continue to watch what's going on. We will see how the futures trade overnight, and of course, the open in the morning. But here it is, in focus tonight. Ghost of Volker. As you might be aware by now, central banks across the globe are raising interest rates higher due to the inflation crisis. Among them, the Bank of Canada, the latest, Governor Tiff McLean, said that he's confident the country's economy can withstand the impact from higher interest rates. Oh, really? <laughs> And of course, today was day two of the freak show, the Jerome Powell testimony. And of course, there was a boycott by the Republican side to protest the nomination of Sarah Bloom Raskin. But the main show was centered around Jerome Powell, what he thinks about what's going on in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the impact on the monetary policy. By now, we know that Jerome Powell, the coward that he is, of course, he is not going to raise interest rates by 50 basis points in March, even though the inflation crisis crisis continues to deepen. We're seeing energy prices surging out of whack. We're seeing commodities across the board, specifically grains and metals, also surging out of whack due to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And on top of that, the inflation crisis that has been going on even before the conflict. And of course, you and me are aware of the origins of this inflation crisis. It is due to the incompetency and the reckless policies by the Federal Reserve led by Jerome Powell. Today, there was a stunning revelation by Powell admitting that the US dollar might not be the only reserve currency in the future, and the developments that we're seeing right now with Russia, Ukraine, and the sanctions will indeed pave the way for multi-global reserve currencies, not just the US dollar. Fed Chair Jerome Powell says the Ukraine war could have the effect of accelerating China's moves to develop alternatives the current dollar-dominated international payments infrastructure. And of course, sometimes the mic does the job perfectly, as it did today. The freak show was absolutely disgusting today. It shows the incompetency of your beloved politicians, of course, that you continue to vote for and where their priorities are. We have crises across multiple fronts, including inflation. When you have the Fed chairman testifying, you would think the first thing would come up to your mind is to ask about inflation and what the Fed's policy and plan to tackle this inflation as it continues to destroy poor and mid-class families in this country. But no, these are not the priorities of the clowns in DC. For example, take a look at this antique and what his priorities are. Thank you. And, and you and others have testified that uh, whether we call it uh, climate change, sea level rise, um, you know, dramatic changes in weather that brings about flooding, storms, name it, um, that is appropriate for review. And while obviously the, the terminology of designating a particular industry, I agree, shouldn't be, but the systemic risk, I, I think, are critically important. And I appreciate the fact that you've recognized that. And I think we need to continue to recognize that. We, we, we live through that uh, literally if we look at the, the number of natural disasters from fires in the West to floods in my state or, or floods in the, the South. Uh. So again, we're asking the Fed chairman not about inflation, not about the national debt, not about the insider trading scandal in the Fed. No, this clown asks about climate change. Oh, really? What is the Fed going to do about climate change, by the way? Stop printing? Because all of that heat from the printing machine, that is contributing to global warming. And now all of these Fed zombies are admitting that inflation will be way higher than expectations. Last year, they've been beating the drum that inflation will be transitory, transitory, transitory. 
But we now know for sure that inflation is not transitory. We have more admissions, this time from Cleveland Fed President Mister, the zombie that she is. And she says she sees 3.5% to 4% inflation, or even higher, at the end of 2022. It was inflation is going to peak by the fourth quarter of 21, and by 22, we will be back at the 2% target. Now they're admitting no, inflation is going to be much higher all the way till the end of 2022. And I say if the Fed zombies say the end of 2022, make that the end of 2023. Another Fed zombie from Chicago, Evans, has been also beating the drum that the Fed is not too late in the curve, that the Fed will tackle the inflation problem easily, it is transitory, once the thing is over and the supply chain ramps up, inflation will be gone, no need from the Fed to intervene. Well, now this zombie says the rate of inflation would probably be around 3 and 3.5% by the end of the year. And if this zombie says 3 to 3.5% by the end of the year, make that, how about 10, 10.5% by the end of the year. And even the good professor from Wharton, Jeremy Siegel, says that it is a big policy mistake for the Fed to slow tightening because of Ukraine. Folks, they're already way behind the game, and now they're slowing. They're slowing the pace of tightening. We went from 50, 25. Before you know it, we go back to zero. No interest rate hikes, and the inflation crisis will get out of hand. The Fed's beige book admits that firms expect an additional price increase over the next several months. What happened to transitory, by the way? This is a clear illustration of the Fed's incompetence. It gets worse for the Fed, by the way. What was the reason behind the lack of action by the Fed, even though it became clear last year that inflation is getting out of control? The excuse from Jerome Powell was, we're waiting for maximum employment. We told Powell at the time, you're not going to get to what you perceive as maximum employment. The economy is already at maximum employment. Things have changed. We will not go back to the unemployment rates of the pre-pandemic era because people are resigning, people are quitting, people are retiring. A lot of the young generation have found other means of gaining an income and they're just not going to join the labor market anymore. So you better move on, Mr. Powell. Move with the plan and start tightening. He did not listen. And now this is what's happening. We are already at maximum employment. A matter of fact, the pace of job creation in this economy is stalling and starting to reverse. Meaning, the pace of economic activities is slowing down dramatically, while the pace of inflation is surging by the day. Hence, stagflation. Today, the jobless claims were at 215,000. This was less than expected. This is good news for the economy. And the reason is employers are so scared of laying off employees or having employees quitting due to the labor shortage. And this comes hand in hand with wage inflation. Here's the problem with the employment picture in this economy. The devil is always, always in the details. For example, when we look at the ADP jobs report that we got yesterday, this is for the private sector of the economy. As you can see, on face value, Everything is going great. The private sector of this economy created 475,000 jobs in February. The problem is small businesses lost 96,000 jobs. This is the beginning of how an economy starts to unwind and starts to collapse. The hit starts with small businesses. They start to feel the pain. And then this pain starts to migrate to mid-sized businesses and little by little. The pain extends to large employers in the economy and we move from stagflation to a recession. This is exactly what's going on in the stock market right now. They shot the high multiple high mania names, the small cap stocks, they all crashed now. Then they're moving to the mid caps. The mid caps are getting shot. Little by little, the large caps, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Googles of the world will also get shot. This is how a stock market crashes. So this is bad, bad news for Jerome Powell and the idiots at the Federal Reserve. Today we got even more alarming news from the ISM Services Survey. As as you can see, new orders are growing at a slower pace. And here it is, the big bomb that we got today. Employment is contracting from growing. It was a drop of 3.8 points from last month. On the other hand, prices continue to increase at a faster pace, and the backlog of orders is also growing at a faster pace. Hence, the stagflation phenomenon. The great resignation is real. The service side of the U.S. economy grows at the slowest pace in a year. So here we go, here we go. Stagflation is here. It's not a joke anymore. It's not a conspiracy theory anymore, as the geniuses have accused me last year. On top of that, inflation continues.
continues to rise higher with no stop in sight. This Russia-Ukraine crisis is deepening the inflation problem. Today, we're hearing talks in D.C. of banning Russian imports of oil and gas. And this will only exacerbate the problem and push prices of energies, specifically crude oil, higher and higher and higher. Matter of fact, Exxon CEO warns and sounds the alarm, saying that the Russia oil disruption will lead to significantly higher prices. So if you thought you've seen it all, you haven't seen anything yet. And why do we have this problem to begin with? This inflation problem. They lied to you. They told you it is due to the thing and the disruptions in the supply chain. And once we're beyond the phase of the thing, the supply chain will be back on track and the inflation problem will be poof, gone. This couldn't be any further from the truth that we have right now. And I've been warning and warning and warning in this program. The inflation crisis that we have right now, it is not due to the supply chain problems. It is not due to the thing. It is not due to the imbalance between supply and demand. Inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon. You increase the money supply irrationally, you will get inflation, but most importantly, if you have incompetent leadership at the Fed, you will definitely get an inflation problem. This is the key to this inflation crisis. The Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, what he said right here. Notice that he said, in guiding inflation higher, we're not using or guided by any mathematical formula. What a genius. What could go wrong? And I said this exactly when Jerome Powell said this. In seeking to achieve inflation at average percent over time, we are not tying ourselves to a particular mathematical formula that defines the average. Thus, our approach, approach could be viewed as a flexible form of average inflation targeting. You're eyeballing inflation now? What happens when you're cooking a recipe? And you eyeball the ingredients, and you eyeball the temperature at the oven, things will go wrong. And this is exactly what the Fed chairman did. He eyeballed inflation. He did not use a guideline, a mathematical formula that says, hey, inflation is getting out of whack, and you're not going to achieve the 2 to 2.5% two average inflation that you're hoping for. Meaning, had he been guided by a mathematical formula, let's say by August of last year, it would have been made clear, the formula would have shown that inflation is getting out of whack and the Fed has to respond right away. But due to the reckless stance by the Federal Reserve led by the delusional madman criminal Jerome Powell, he did not guide inflation with a mathematical formula. And now we're all paying the price. And by the way, they say inflation will cool down. It will be tamed by the end of the year. At some point, inflation will go away. Does this mean that the prices that you and I are paying right now and the increase in the cost of living will go down? Listen to the answer by Jerome Powell. The concept of transitory is really this. It is that uh, the increases will happen. We're not saying they will reverse. That's not what transitory means. It means that the increases in prices will happen. So there will be inflation, but that the process of inflation uh, will stop so that so that there won't be further inf what we when we think of inflation we really think of inflation going up year upon year upon year upon year that's inflation when you have inflation for 12 months or whatever it may be i'm just taking an example and not making an estimate then then you have a price increase but you don't have an inflation process and so part of that just is it, that if it doesn't affect longer term inflation expectations then it's very likely not to infect uh, to to affect the process of inflation going forward. So what what I mean by transitory is just something that doesn't leave a permanent mark on the inflation process. Again, we don't mean I don't mean that 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 you know producers are going to take those price increases back. That's that's not the idea. It's just that they won't go on indefinitely. So here it is. What he means by inflation cooling down, it means the rate of increase in inflation year over year but he doesn't mean that prices will go down now what does that mean as we're speaking right now inflation has risen higher than the rise or the growth in wages so you're already down your purchasing power is already down your standard of living is already down now when jerome powell says that your inflation or inflation is not going to go higher let's say next year meaning the pace of acceleration and in inflation will cool down in reality what that means is your rent let's say this year will go higher by 20 percent next year your rent maybe will go higher by five percent or eight percent in jerome powell's book 
This is inflation cooling down and the inflation problem going away. The problem for you and I, the consumer, is, well, our rent is going higher, but our wages are not keeping up. So net-net, we're left with less purchasing power and a damaged standard of living, and this will last for years to come. And now the critics are coming out of the woodwork. For example, remember Slimy Mnuchin? When he was in power, he was in favor of printing on steroids to so-called save the economy, aka propping the stock market. Now that he's not in power, all of a sudden he comes out and says the Fed has to be aggressive in tightening the monetary policy. Take a listen. We never got the chance to ask you in the administration, or at least you wouldn't answer when you were in the administration, what, what you thought about Fed policy. The Fed's obviously in a pretty tricky spot right here. And the big debate in the markets <clears throat> is how quickly should they be raising rates? Are they behind the curve? Are we going to be able to get our arms around inflation? Will they do too much damage? to the economy by raising too quickly. I just wonder which side of the, the debate you come down on, what would you like to see happen? Well, now it, it is more fun. This is one of the few things I can freely talk about now. I couldn't talk about the Fed. I mean, as you, as you know, Jay Powell and I are very close. You put uh, him in the job. I, I, I did encourage the president to, to put him in the job. Uh, Look, I, I, I personally think the Fed needs to be aggressive now in combating inflation. For, for a very long period of time, the Fed could not get inflation to 2%. Uh, Powell changed it to where they said they do it to 2% over time. I think at the time pre-COVID, that was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, I, I would have stopped the COVID spending. We spent $4 trillion. That was a lot. Uh, I think we got to cut back on this ongoing government funding. But there's no question in my mind, if the Fed raises interest rates and if the Fed begins to run off the portfolio, that's going to have a big impact on inflation. Whether he raises 25 or 50 basis points, I saw the comment yesterday that he said 25. I, I think what he does at any single that's important. I think uh, the question is, what? where are we? A year from now, you know, 18 months from now, I think we'll be at two, two and a half percent Fed funds and three, three and a half percent and 10 years. Just a reminder of this revolving door, this filthy swamp, the corruption in D.C. This guy, once he graduated from the Treasury Department, he raised billions of dollars to start a hedge fund. Do we even have a faith in our government anymore when it became a revolving door? Nobody's interested in public service anymore. They get in to become richer when they graduate. And this ties in with the crisis of incompetent leadership that we have in this country right now. I mean, listen to the former head of the SEC who's been in a coma by by the way, through the entirety of his tenure, Jay Clayton. And he says, in not so subtle ways, perhaps we need a little bit of corruption. We need a little bit of insider trading in the government to incentivize the talent, quote unquote, from the private sector to join public service. Unbelievable. But take a listen. Sure. Which is any kind of any kind of program here, you have to have fairness. We don't want people taking advantage of information that they gain through their public service. Absolutely against the law etc. Um, you want confidence. You want the American people to have confidence that if we have those rules, they're being enforced. Then what you want to have is our people in government to be invested alongside the American people. We don't want them excluded from the market. In our country, you're saving for your own retirement. We have you know, 300 million people who someday, one way or another, are going to rely on market performance to pay for their retirement. You, we want our elected representatives to be sitting alongside them. And then last, we don't want rules that exclude people from serving in government. And this is particularly important. We've seen over the last few years just how important it is to have private sector up-to-date expertise enter the government. And if you'll bear with me, um, and we see this from both sides of the aisle, this should not be a, this should not be a partisan issue. Just two people who are on your program often, Scott Gottlieb, Gina Raimondo. When they speak, they have that private sector, public sector expertise, and they tie it all together. Of course, he brings up Dr. Shu Polish Gottlieb, who used to be the commissioner of the FDA, and now he's a bitch for Pfizer, getting millions and millions of dollars. This is the revolving door. He was supposed to oversee Pfizer as an FDA commissioner. Once he graduated from his position, he becomes a board member at Pfizer, cashing millions of dollars. How did that happen? I'll tell you how. He was doing favors to Pfizer while he was an FDA commissioner. And you wonder why the public is losing faith, losing trust in government. And this leads me, during the freak show, the testimony of Jerome Powell in DC today, 
There was an exchange that caught my attention. It involves former Fed Chairman, legendary Fed Chairman Paul Volcker. Take a listen. The leadership at the Fed under you and the Fed prepared to do what it takes to get inflation under control uh, and protect price stability. Well, let me say I knew Paul Volcker. I, I'm pretty sure I saw him testify in this room many years ago. I think he was one of the great public servants of the era, the greatest economic public servant wow. of the era. And I hope history will re record that the answer to your question is yes. So you're, at, you're, you're prepared to do what it takes without any reservation to uh, protect price stability? Yes. And that would be a departure of what you've done. Thank you very much. This is indeed a departure from the madman policies of Powell of printing money on steroids to prop up the equities and real estate markets to, excuse me, now becoming Volcker and doing what it takes to tame inflation? Are we children to believe that? To begin with, Jerome Powell doesn't have the spine to become a Volcker. Take a look at what legendary Fed Chairman Paul Volcker did when there was an inflation crisis back in the 70s and 80s. Volcker, who headed the Federal Reserve in the 1980s during the Carter and Reagan presidencies, knows about resistance. What's happening here? When was this? Oh, this would have been when I was chairman of the Federal Reserve and interest rates were 20%. Yeah. And the criticism was coming in. He pushed interest rates above 20% to conquer inflation and succeeded. But Volcker had to take the country into recession to do it. There's a lot of people that just aren't making it. And the move provoked the most widespread protests in the Fed's history. Angry farmers blockaded the Fed with their tractors. Was that a tough time? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fair to say that was a difficult time. Three decades later, he's under attack again, this time from the banks. Some CEOs have been particularly critical of you. I wasn't aware of that. That amazes me. <laughs> Are you telling me that? No. Uh, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, said Paul Volcker, by his own admission, has said he doesn't understand capital markets. He has proven that to me. Well, unfortunately, I think that they proved some of that to me, too. <laughs> and their own misunderstanding. How did they get in so much trouble? Do we really believe that Jerome Powell have this kind of ethics and integrity? We have a crisis corruption in our government. The Fed chairman himself was caught inside a trading. Fed presidents under his leadership were caught inside a trading. We have a crisis in competency and leadership across our government. And it is a stark difference between the filth that we have today, the ethics and competent leadership of Paul Volcker. Listen to his take about public service. Paul, what would you like your legacy to be? Oh God, my legacy. I'd like to see my legacy a more effective Government in general, I haven't got any control over the high politics or any influence, but I would like to see a general acceptance of the need for an efficient public service ethic and see people attracted toward public service because they can take satisfaction that they're doing something concrete for the country and the people uh, generally. And it can certainly test their own acumen and intelligence and energy to do that kind of thing. Folks, with all of these crises that we have in this country right now, be it economic or political, the real shortage we're suffering from is a shortage of competent leadership. Paul Volcker was a leader who did the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. He did not expect credit, praise, or wealth in return. He just did the right thing. Volcker saved this country from a dire economic outcome by doing the right thing. And because of that, the great inflation of the 1970s ended and the boom of the 1980s and 1990s happened. You don't see a lot of statues out there of Paul Volcker. Matter of fact, not many Americans are familiar with him. He's the kind of hero I look up to and admire doing the right thing silently with no expectations of personal gain. Today in this country, we long for a Volcker like leadership and hopefully amidst the chaos this leadership will emerge soon and guide us to the light at the end of the tunnel but with this note out of the way folks let's move on and cover the market information today and we start with the performance of indices and here we go
The Dow Industrial Average was down 96.69 points, or a decline of 0.29%. The Nasdaq down big, 214.8 points, or a loss of 1.56%. The S&P 500 also in the red, down 23.5 points, or a decline of 50, excuse me, 50, that would be wild, right? 0.53%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal, utilities. At number two for the silver, materials. Number three for the bronze, REITs. The laggards of the day led by cyclicals, technology, and communication services. What about the advanced to decline ratios, NYSE 39% advancing versus 56% declining. The NASDAQ 29% advancing versus 66% declining. Commodities, what's going on here? Believe it or not, crude oil was actually trading significantly higher overnight. Matter of fact, Brent was closer to 120 bucks a barrel. But in the morning and right before the close, you gotta be a little suspicious. It raises my alarms when this kind of news comes right before the open. We got the news that it is in the bag. Within 72 hours, we will get an Iran nuclear deal, which means the millions and millions of barrels from the Iranian output could hit the market right away. I doubt that this will actually happen. I believe it is fake news intended to prop up the stock market by dumping oil. So once again, all of these dips in oil will be bought right away. The WTI closed the day down with almost 2.5% to the downside. Brent was down almost 2.25%. Likewise, gasoline, heating oil, natural gas, we're all down, be it modestly. And of course, we're already seeing the pain at the pump. Here in California, prices are climbing by the day, and drivers are blown away with the rapid increase at the pump. You're seeing lines, massive lines at Costco to score cheap gas, quote unquote. It's not really cheap. And luckily for me, I work from home, at least for now. At some point, I'm going back. But my wife, for example, she drives a lot for work. What does that mean? Her employer have to compensate for this gas expense. This is an extra increase in input prices for these companies. What does that mean? They're going to pass the extra cost to the end consumer. And all in all, this will push inflation higher and higher and higher. And of course, you heard from your politicians across the aisle. It is bipartisan at this point. Democrats and Republicans are suggesting that we ban imports of oil from Russia. Now, here's the problem. Maybe the bans of oil imports from Russia will hurt the Russian economy in the flow of money to the coffers in Russia, but it will not dent inflation down. So we have to ask, and the politicians have to ask themselves, what is the purpose behind this ban? Is it to punish Russia? And if it is, then yes, it will have a small dent in Russia's flow of money. But if it is intended to tackle inflation down, if anything, this will push inflation higher. Because all of these commodities, folks, are traded globally at exchange rates. It doesn't matter where the oil is coming from, Russia, Ukraine, whatever. Matter of fact, the WTI comes from Texas, and these prices are surging higher. What your dear politicians don't understand is, if we have a shortage of supply in one market, it has a global impact in commodities trading. These futures move higher even if you have a shortage of supply in one important market. So regardless, the prices of oil will continue to move higher. Whether this oil comes from Russia, whether this oil comes from Saudi Arabia, whether it comes domestically, it doesn't matter. The prices will continue to move higher because at the end of the day, you buy these commodities from the New York exchange, from the Chicago exchange, from the London exchange. All these prices are set. You buy at market price. Of course, there are deals between countries in terms of pricing, but the majority of the trade happens via exchanges. So these prices will continue to climb. And what is the plan here? from our dear politicians to tackle the inflation problem in energy prices. More restrictions on Russia will push these prices higher and higher and higher. And as you can see, other energy commodities are also surging out of whack, mainly coal. Remember the old school coal? Well, the so-called green energy initiatives are very good for coal. Matter of fact, coal has been the best performing commodity of last year. And so far, it appears that it will be the top performing commodity this year too. As you can see, the new castle coal futures pretty much in a vertical line to the moon, trading as a meme stock. Likewise, we're seeing Amsterdam gas prices also surging out of whack. They're moving higher again, and I believe they will take the highs from December, perhaps surpass that. Folks, there are ramifications of war, 
and the sanctions that followed after that. And we're all going to feel it. But specifically in Europe, they're going to feel it much more than we do because we're kind of isolated from Russia, economically speaking. It's a different story in Europe. Back to the futures. What about softs? We have an upside day for lumber. Look at lumber surging higher again, closing the day with gains of over 3.5%. Likewise, we have gains for sugar, also closing the day with gains over 1.5%. We also have gains for cocoa, cotton, and OJ. The laggard of the day in softs was coffee. Coffee was down almost 3% today. What about metals? They're all moving higher. All eyes, of course, on palladium. Palladium closed the day with gains of almost 4%. But gold was higher. Silver, platinum, copper were all higher. What about meats? It's a down day across the board. Live feeder cattle, lean hogs, all down. No exception here. What about grains? Grains is the trade for the year so far. And the rally in grains continues to go on with no stop in sight. All eyes, of course, on wheat. Wheat surged higher today again by more than 7%. And by the way, the war is good for us. Yeah, baby, more money. Because China is now buying more corn, soybeans, and wheat from the United States because the supply from Ukraine and Russia is nowhere to be found. We have calls from Citibank. The extreme bullish scenario for wheat will push this commodity higher by almost 30%. 5% from this point on. So we haven't seen the end of gains for wheat. And I say forget about 35. If the crisis continues and we see a legit shortage of supply and perhaps no supplies coming out of Ukraine and Russia due to clogged ports or whatever, you will see wheat prices perhaps doubling. Mark my words. We're already trading above 1,000. It could get a lot worse. But we're seeing massive gains beyond wheat. We're seeing corn, rough rice, oats, canola, soybeans, soybean meal, all surging higher, significantly so. The only lagger today was soybean oil, closing the day in the red by almost half a percentage point. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? The hottest table by far is Apple at around 1.1 million contracts traded today. About 67% of those were calls. At a number two, Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 850,000 contracts traded today for the name. About 55% of those were calls. And how'd you like the action today? The bears crushed the so-called Tesla whale because he abandoned the 900 calls for Friday. The expiration date was Friday. He's been pumping, 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 getting in and out in the same day over and over and over again by buying these 900 calls. Today, he got out holding a massive bag of losses. So this is a big victory for the bears today. But here it is, number three, we have AMD at around 600,000 contracts traded today. About 64% of those were calls. And of course, the retail traders are buying or trading the RSX, the Russia ETF, specifically buying a lot of call options way out of the money, expecting that pop higher. It's not going to happen, folks, unless we have a peace deal, unless we have a ceasefire, unless the ruble starts to recover. When is that going to happen? Who knows? All what we're seeing right now in TV, things are getting worse. And for all you know it, they could ban trading of the RSX soon, so be careful out there. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market today? We start with the ticker XOP. This is the oil and gas ETF. They're buying the 135 calls for the expiration date, April 14th, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 12% by then. They paid about three bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about four and a half million dollars. What about the trades for the ticker INDA for India? This is the Indian ETF. Now, by the way, India is livid about the sanctions against Russia. They're not happy about it. They're also not happy about how their students were treated as they've been evacuated out of Ukraine. The discrimination of who gets into the train or not. Of course, if you got a little darker skin, yeah, you're at the back of the bus. You got to wait in line. And the Indians are not happy about what's going on here. But the sanctions against Russia will hurt the Indian economy because there is a lot of trade that goes between India and Russia. Now they cannot buy anything from Russia out of fear of sanctions. So somebody's buying puts here expecting the Indian ETF to drop down. And they're doing so via put spread. They're buying the 40 puts and they're selling the 38 puts for the expiration date March 18th. They paid about 40 cents a piece in buying the 40 bucks puts and they received about 20 cents a piece from selling the 38 puts. All in all, they spent about 20 cents a piece for this trade and that brings the total for this trade at around 2 
$100,000. What about the trades for the ticker? SNAP Snapchat. This is a call spread. They're buying the 37.5 calls and they're selling the 40.5 calls. All for the expiration date March 11th. Of course, the expectations are that Snapchat could pop higher, but not more than 13.5% by the expiration date of March 11th. They paid about 90 cents a piece for buying the 37.5 calls and they received about 30 cents a piece in credit from selling the 40.5 calls. All in all, that brings down the entry cost to around 60 cents a piece, and in total, they paid about $500,000 to enter this trade. What about the trade for the ticker GLD? This is the gold ETF they're buying calls. In this case, the 195 calls for the expiration date May 20th. With the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 8% by then, they paid about 2 bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1.7 million. What about the trade for the ticker CLF? Cleveland Cliffs. Somebody's buying the dip here. The 29 calls for the expiration date, May 20th. With the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 14% by then, they paid about one buck and 85 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about one million dollars. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker APLS? This is for Apelis Pharma. I believe this is the correct pronunciation. The name was down big today and somebody ex is expecting more pain to come by buying the 40 bucks puts for the expiration date April 14th. With the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 9.5% by then, they paid about 4 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $2 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis. What's going on here? It is a mixed picture, but value is at performing growth tremendously. You're seeing utilities, REITs, materials, energy, Exxon, Chevron, healthcare, the big pharma name, the consumer staples, all moving higher. But the most notable movers today, number one, we have Kroger. Kroger was up over 10% today on better than expected earnings. And I've been saying, folks, you gotta buy Kroger. And I've said that back in the summer of 2020. You can go back in the videos. I made a video about it. The safest stock out there. And it remains my largest holding. You gotta stick with these names because, number one, they're inflation proof. Number two, these names test the resiliency of consumer spending. If it gets bad out there and the consumer cannot spend on luxuries and services and eating out, for example, they're still gonna have to eat by shopping at Kroger. So this is a name that will hold all the way and it's going to hold better than the rest of these names even when the crash happens. And we have an update for another notable mover today, Rivian. Rivian was down again, yet they're backpedaling and they're saying all of these increases that we informed you with yesterday, the 20% increase in prices, well, we're going to take that off because of the backlash. So what does that mean either way? It means that the company's margins will be down big. They cannot increase their prices higher. That tells you this is not an inflation-proof company. Moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. Again, a sea of red with few exceptions. We have rates, we have utilities, the XL U, Staples, XLP, Materials, XME, the inverse indices specifically for the Qs, the S triple Qs, VIX proxies, we're lining up green, but besides that, it's not a good picture out there. As you can see, values at performing growth, value slightly in the green, growth deeply in the red. Look at international markets. European stocks are getting hammered. But look at the EWZ, look at the Latin Americans, ETFs, Colombia, and the likes, Peru. They're at performing. Stick with Latin America right now. Avoid Europe meaning short Europe, long Latin America, specifically Brazil. Moving on to charts, and we start with this. In the morning, the fake news came out that we have an Iran deal. Right away, oil went down, and the futures gapped up higher. Matter of fact, the SPY gapped higher in the morning. Unfortunately for the bulls, it was a gap and crap. It gapped higher, then it lost the support of 438. But the good news for the bulls is the chart continued to dance around the support of 434, and it held that support by the end of the day. So we're not back at the line in the sand at around 430. If we go back there, if that gap is closed, and then the chart starts straight below the line in the sand, then we're going down, baby. We're going down to 422 and perhaps even beyond that because the bears would argue, even though we had some attempts today to pump the market higher, the plunge protection team was active, plunging, plunging, plunging all day long. But despite the efforts, it did not work out. Because the bears would argue, what if this is a bear flag formation? Maybe we're still having the double top formation from yesterday. Even though 
the chart gapped a little higher in the trading range of the resistance of 438. But let's say this is a bear flag formation. Who's to say this is not going to play out and we will see another flush down all the way to 422. So the bears are starting to creep back in the picture here. What about the daily chart for the SPY's continuous contract? We had an attempt to crack above 4,384 and a half. It did not work. It doesn't mean that we have a rejection yet even though the candle, as you see right now, is a rejection candle, is a reversal candle. But mind you, the trading is active right now. And this was a knee-jerk reaction to the nuclear accident in Ukraine. Let's say that this is not as bad as we're thinking right now. The futures could pop higher again. So until and unless we have a closing keyword closing like this you don't have a reversal signal yet the momentum indicators are dancing around going back to negative divergence or extending the positive divergence so we have inconclusive action in the momentum indicators the volume is down today it is below average so this is good for the bulls but this volume can ramp up higher again if we have another sell-off day so so far the bulls still have the advantage a slight advantage but boy the bears are creeping in big time what about the cues 30 minutes chart again it was a gap and crap the bad news for the cues is we lost the support of 343 once again why isn't the chart capable of trading above 343 why is this level acting as a magnet pulling the chart back every time it tries to escape higher this level pulls it back again this tells me that this is not a solid support for the cues the cues is not ready to rally from 343 it needs to go down to retest perhaps 334 or even below that and the bears would argue what if this is a bear flag formation that it is already playing out something to think about here's a daily chart for the continuous contract for the queues and again it was an attempt to crack above 14,445 and it failed is it a rejection it is for now why because the chart lost the support of 14,000 yet it is inconclusive and the reason is trading in this chart is still active right now we're not done we haven't closed the day yet but if we close the day like this then it is a reversal sing signal and the confirmation would be closing the day below 13,599. We look at the momentum indicators, they're neutral. They're curling down again, back in negative divergence, but the action remains neutral for now. The volume is below average, this favors the bulls so for now i would say it's 50 50 between the bulls and the bears but the bears have gained significant advantage from today's action what about the iwm the russell 2000 small caps 30 minutes chart the chart went all the way to 204 and a half and it couldn't make it above that it couldn't crack and close the day above 204 and a half is this conclusive action the iwm is rejected from that point on not really we have yet to revisit the gap if the chart goes down to close the gap and then if fails to rebound after closing the gap then we have an indicator that the bears are creeping in and sooner or later this chart will go down to 196 and a half the dixie what's going on here it doesn't matter whether you have a reversal candle or not in the dixie's chart it is a momentum trade right now it is a hot trade right now as the ruble continues to crash so i'm not going to bother identifying another resistance level because who's to say that this is not going to continue to move higher impulsively so as we're seeing by the way in wheat and oil and all of them we have to wait till the support of 96 is broken then you know that the dollar is done rallying and by the way a rally in the u.s dollar will crush the margins of international corporations so this is not a good development for the stock market about gold what's going on here again the technicals are overextended but the momentum the resiliency the supporting fundamentals remain strong so this chart is a buy for now you continue to buy it until and unless the chart tells us that it's over and for now we don't have any sign that says it is over what about the 10-year yield what's going on here a 180 from yesterday's action at least for now we're back at the support of 1.7 you have a little bit of good news in the russia ukraine front and this chart pops higher you have bad news and this chart flushes down and for now we have bad news so we're back at 1.7 on top of that we have a negative divergence in the rsi indicating that perhaps we will go back to 155 the fed is not jacking interest rates as we thought they will number two the russia ukraine front 
is destroying the prospect of growth in the economy, which means that financial stocks will continue to receive more pain. There's more pain to come for financials. So unfortunately for now, financials is not a place to park in. What about the TFT? Bond prices from a weekly chart perspective again, it is recovering. Perhaps it will give it another shot at 140. We'll see. Look at the RSI curling its way higher again. And the volume went higher, not on the selling side, but on the buying side. That tells you we're seeing some panic buying of bonds if this continues and by the way the news that i'm seeing right now is not supportive for equities right now it is supportive of buying bonds and safety if that happens the tlt in no time will recover 140 the question is can the tlt close the week above 140 this will be a decisive victory for the tlt bugs but closing the week again below 140 will be a decisive defeat because you have all the supportive fundamentals you have the news the panic why can't this chart close above 140 here's a four hours chart for the vix for now the action pay attention now the action is inconclusive and you're seeing all of these pies being served in the market and the reason is the vix didn't make its mind yet the fix is not sure should it go down all the way to 20 as support or should it pop higher and recapture 33 as support for now we have a triangle consolidation it could break either way you're not going to go ahead and buy or sell short or go long until and unless you have a resolution of this triangle that you see in the VIX's chart. What about the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ? Inconclusive, still within a range. Look at the MACD indicator. It could pop either way, up or down. So you gotta wait for a confirmation here. You're better off staying in the sidelines until and unless we have a signal. Otherwise, the pies are hot and ready to be served. What about Apple, the daily chart? It was a positive development for Apple because it traded above the upper edge of the channel, the upper range of the channel in yellow. And it closed pretty much at that line. So this is a good development for Apple. The momentum indicators are curling the way higher. The question is, can Apple close the week above the upper edge, the upper range of the channel? And better yet, close above the resistance at 172.4? We'll see. If the chart moves back within the channel and closes the week that way, then boy, we have a lot of trouble ahead. What about an hourly chart for Tesla? It is fading away. The pop is fading away. We have a negative divergence on the RSI. The pumping is done. We now have a gap at around 809.75. Let's see how the chart is going to perform after it goes down there. I opened a small position in puts here today, expecting a drop in Tesla, at least all the way down to the 809.75 gap so i have the 800 puts for now it is an initial position and i can play around it depending on how the chart is going to develop but for now it appears that the bears are starting to fight back and we have more bad news for the souffle by the way we are already aware about the problems with phantom braking but it appears that we have a car that pretty much slammed in the brake stopping the car abruptly in the middle of the highway and unfortunately of course the driver passed away right now this is under investigation and it could produce more trouble for the souffle. With that being said, we know that this is the Tony Montana stock. He keeps shooting at it and it doesn't die. But sooner or later, the guy with the shotgun from behind is going to creep in and end the game. What about BTC, Bitcoin? What's going on here? Whoops. It appears that the support of 42,000, at least for now, is lost. Keep in mind, trading right now is underway. This could be a bull flag consolidation for all we know. But it also could be a triple top. And a triple top formation is the ultimate bear formation. It seals the deal. The top is here and the chart will not trade above that level for a long, long time. So it is a battlefield right now between the bulls and the bears. If we have a recapture of 42,000 once again and a pop higher, then you know this is not a triple top. It is actually a bull flag formation. If it goes down again and it starts trading below the pop candle in green, below the low of that candle, then you know it's over. Run for the hill. You will see 30,000 in BTC sooner or later. Lastly, what about AMC and hourly chart? What's going on here? It continues to consolidate. This is not bearish or bullish, at least for now. We're waiting and waiting and waiting for a pop. Retest 21 as resistance once again. If 21 is recaptured as support, this 
will excite the apes to jump in and buy AMC. We have some good news, good fundamental news for AMC. The raising price is higher. Now we have to wait for the reception, the Batman movie. If the movie is a blockbuster hit, then you know that AMC has the pricing power, meaning it is an inflationary stock, at least in certain instances. In this case, these big blockbuster movies. So we'll see. But for now, and moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the big non-farm payrolls, all eyes on the payrolls, the unemployment rate. Of course, we have more Fed zombies speaking. In this case, Chicago Fed zombie Charles Evans. And with that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again over the weekend.